Welcome back everybody. I'm Archbishop Christopher Prowse from the Archdiocese of Canberra Goulburn and this is our third session of Heart to Heart e-Seminar. So you would recall the first session was um, introductory. The second session was about our beginning of our inner pilgrimage and what we would need externally. Today is our inner pilgrimage and what, what attitudes or foundational um, thoughts that should we have deep within us, the inner journey. So dear friends, as we uh, still are in the COVID-19 restrictions of going outside, there's no restriction on us going inside. So let's be courageous and let's the Holy Spirit now take us onto the journey deep within us with the Lord Jesus leading us, the way, the truth and the life. When we go on the inner journey, there's always the yearning, the thirsting, the hunger. That's where we start. We start with the inner yearning. And there's no better psalm that speaks of this, and I'll use this for our opening prayer, than the wonderful psalm, Psalm 63. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. Like a dry, weary land where there is no water. But I have seen you in the sanctuary and behold your power and your glory. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. My soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me. We make this and all our prayers through Christ the Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, that's wonderful. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. So it is the Lord who leads us. We're not on our own. In fact, to lead the spiritual life on your own is disastrous because it's the spiritual will, what other spirits, but it's the Holy Spirit leading us. That is the key point of that beautiful psalm. So over these uh, introductory comments now, as we talk about the journey inward, we focus on the early centuries of the church. Of course, we have the Gospels, we have Jesus, uh, then we have uh, particularly St. John and St. Paul, who talk about their inner journey, the, the journey back to the Father, the journey with the Holy Spirit. And um, they all, um, over the first couple of centuries of the church, uh, where there's great persecution, there, there's a beginning of, I suppose, a mystical, or the, or the beginning of the monastic tradition. And we hear in the early centuries from people like John Cassian, uh, one of the early desert fathers, desert fathers and mothers in the early centuries of the church, start to articulate the inward journey. And John Cassian, he wrote down a lot of his uh, retreats, I suppose, retreat notes, his conferences, and they have been kept with us over the centuries. They were particularly influential on uh, St. Benedict in the 5th, 6th century, when he began the Western monasticism or the Western wave of mysticism. And his great rule, the rule of St. Benedict, uh, which is uh, a, a Christian classic, by the way, all these books that I bring up, you don't need to worry too much about them. We'll, we'll make sure that we take uh, pictures of them and they'll be put on the website. So just relax. <laughs> but uh, here in the, this simple 5th, uh, 6th century uh, document, he begins by saying to listen with the ear of the heart. What a wonderful, listen with the ear of the heart. As we begin the inward journey, let's take it from one of the great saints of the early church, on mysticism, on monasticism in the Western world at least, listening with the ear of the heart. So um, I'd like to begin with a lovely quote from St. Teresa of Avila in the Middle Ages now, uh, the great Carmelite mystic, the Spanish woman, a Spanish Carmelite nun. Uh, as she says, um, deep prayer, the deep inward journey is a close sharing between friends it means taking time frequently to be alone with him who we know loves us. To be alone with him who we know 
loves us. Be in a journey with the Lord who loves us. And over these early centuries, which have now come to us still, there are many, many things that could be said. In the few minutes I have with you, I'm just going to pick out three words, which to me are big summary words, of what has been passed on to us from the early church through monastic monasticism and through now. We could say hundreds of things, but I'm just going to pick out three simple words, and they all begin with S. So the first word on the inner journey foundational word is the love and appreciation of the first is silence silence different types of silence I mean you can have the external silence which you turn off the TV you turn off the radio you turn off the iPad all the rest of it and you can have external silence but there is a deeper silence isn't there there's that inner silence when you begin to pray and you turn off all the music and you have external quietness, you can find that there's so much noise, this dictatorship of noise <laughs> coming from within you, not from without. And you and I would call them distractions. One thing that the, in regard to coming to an inner silence that the, uh, the church has taught us is the importance of repetitive prayer. Like we have the rosary, that's repetitive prayer, but even to cut it right down just to a couple of words, uh, we have the Jesus prayer, that's come down through the centuries. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. You repeat that. That will help you to focus on Jesus rather than the distractions. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's called the Jesus prayer. And even coming down to one word, a beautiful word, Maranatha. There's four syllables, Maranatha. Come Lord Jesus. That's been retrieved again through uh, wonderful new renewals of Christian meditation in our times, the worldwide Christian meditation movement, uh, John Main, Lawrence Freeman and all the rest, they can help us to retrieve these uh, wonderful treasures. And um, coming to that inner silence. Now, once we try to move in that direction, uh, we find there's um, just a delight to be silent before the Lord. A contemporary of uh, of St. Teresa of Avila in the Middle Ages, also a Carmelite Spanish, but uh, he, he and, uh, and St. Teresa knew each other and uh, helped each other on the spiritual journey, St. John of the Cross. He coined a beautiful expression, which I really love when I start to pray. He calls it silent love. What a wonderful definition of meditation, contemplation, silent love. Another saint around that same time, he called it silence as a symbol of the world to come. A symbol of the world to come. What does he mean? You know, when we, when we go to God in heaven, and presumably, you know, the, the language of God is silence. I mean, God knows all the languages, you know, it's English and all the languages of the world, but God's mother tongue, I like to call it, God's mother tongue is silence. And learning to contemplate and to go deep within is learning the language of God and being comfortable in silent love. So silence. Actually, a friend of mine, she, she's great on jumbling up words. Um, she said silent, S-I-L-E-N-T. If you jumble that word up, you get another word using the same letters and you get L-I-S-T-E-N. Listen really thankful for that wonderful it's a, it's a it's a cute little expression but it's lovely so what does silent means it means to listen the word itself suggested by the letters listening with the ear of the heart silence symbol of the world to come the second word now the second word is the word stillness Stillness. This has come down over the centuries. Not to fidget, not to be moving around. Just sit down or whatever, or just be silent. It's a bit like Moses in front of the burning bush uh, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. There is Moses. He comes along and he finds the following. There in front of him appeared in flames of fire from within a bush. 
Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. It did not burn up. That's been, he was still before this. There we have the, the bush that was uh, on fire but not consumed. I find over the years that my Aboriginal friends have taught me a lot about what silence really means. And um, one of my friends from Australia, from Daly River, uh, she's written the preface to this rather big book, Our Mob, God's Story, and it's uh, Aboriginal religious art. And there is uh, my friend Miriam Rose Ungermeyer Bauman on the preface of this big book. Uh, she has this to say about stillness. Our Aboriginal culture has taught us to be still and to wait. We do not try to hurry things up. We let them follow their natural course, like the seasons. We watch the moon in each of its phases. We wait for the rain to fill our rivers and water the thirsty earth. When twilight comes, we prepare for the night. At dawn, we rise with the sun. And we wait for God too. His time is the right time. We wait for him in stillness to make his word clear to us. We don't worry. We know that in time and in the spirit of Dadiri, which means that deep listening and quiet stillness, his way will be made clear. There are deep springs within each of us. The very spirit of God is a sound, the sound of deep calling to deep. The sound is the word of God. The sound is Jesus. There's the wow moment. Isn't it fantastic, everybody, that although on one level I'm giving you the insights, some of the insights of some of our mystical tradition going back to the early centuries, our ancient Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people going back thousands of and thousands of years, are able to articulate somewhat similar expressions. This to me is, is a great opportunity for us through meditation and contemplation, silence and stillness, to come closer to our first Australians through the mystical tradition we both share. So there we have that one. Now the third one is... Um, the third word is simplicity. Now, simplicity in prayer, uh, well, sometimes children pray a lot better than us. There's simplicity. I mean, one of, one of the great definitions of de deep prayerful silence comes from John Vianney, the patron, uh, the French parish priest who was seen to be a, a peasant and they use that word quite deliberately, uh, in the 18th, 19th century, the patron saint of all priests, his definition of prayer is simply this. I look at him, he looks at me. I look at him, he looks at me. There's deep inner prayer. There's deep inner simplicity. I've come across a, a, a saint on the way who also, uh, he, when I read his uh, spiritual writings, he reminds me of John Vianney, and he's on the way to becoming a saint. In fact, I was able to meet him some years ago when I was studying in Rome. He, um, he was the former Archbishop of Saigon in Vietnam. He was imprisoned by the communists there for, for many, many years, for uh, 13 years, and nine of them in solitary confinement. And um, he wrote a lot in... in um, in prison about prayer. And when he was finally released, uh, he, uh, he, he started to write and give retreats in Rome. That's where I met him. Uh, he, he's close to us in Australia because his mum lived in Sydney for many, many years he's with his sister. He's, another sister lived uh, up until recently here in Canberra and she's gone to God too. So, uh, but the family is there and uh, he saw himself as uh, a bit of an Australian when I was talking to him because uh, his, when his mum lived in Australia, the children become part of Australia. Anyway, he's written this beautiful little book called uh, Five Loaves and Two Fish. The name is Cardinal Nguyen Van Thuan. 
Cardinal Nguyen Van Thuan. You may or may not have heard of him, but I tell you what, when you read his thoughts on prayer and simplicity, you understand what I'm talking about. Here is a little story that he writes about prayer. There was an older man named Jim who would go to church every day at noon for just a few minutes and then he would leave. The sacristan was very curious about Jim's daily routine and one day he stopped in to ask, why do you come here every day? Oh, I come to pray, Jim answered. Oh, but well, that's impossible. What prayer can you say in just two minutes? Oh, I'm an old ignorant man. I pray to God in my own way. Yeah, but what do you say? Oh, I just say, Jesus, here I am, it's Jim. And then I leave. After some years, Jim became ill and had to go to the hospital where he was admitted to the ward for the poor. When it seemed that Jim was dying, a priest and a nurse, a religious sister, stood near his bed. The priest asked, Jim, tell us how it is, uh, how it is that from the very first day you came into this hospital, everything changed for the better. How is it that the patients have become happier, more content and friendlier? I don't know, said Jim. When I could walk around, I would try to visit everyone. I greeted them, talked a bit with them, and when I couldn't get out of bed, I called everyone over to me to make them laugh and to keep them happy. With Jim, they always are happy. But why are you so happy? Oh, well, aren't you happy when you receive a visitor every day? asked Jim. Of course, but, but Jim, we've never seen you ever receive a visitor. Well, when I came here, I asked for two chairs. One was for you and one was reserved for my guest. But what guest? The priest asked. I used to go to church to visit Jesus every day at noon. But when I couldn't do that anymore, Jesus came here. Jesus comes to visit you. What does he say? Oh, nothing much. He just says, Jim, here I am. It's Jesus. Before dying, Jim smiled and gestured with his hand towards the chair next to his bed as if inviting someone to sit down. He smiled for the last time and closed his eyes. Wow, Jim. Jim's prayer. There's nobody here participating right now who can say, Bishop, I don't know how to pray. I've just given you the most beautiful prayer you could pray. Jesus, here I am, and you say your name. Jesus, here I am, it's Chris. It's Christopher, that's what sometimes I say. And listen carefully to Jesus say back to you, Christopher, here I am, it's Jesus. That is deep prayer. And we can all pray like that with simplicity. So there's the three S's, everybody. Silence, stillness, Simplicity. I'd like you to think seriously about that as we now go on to the questions and uh, see if in the groups afterwards, I know there's some groups forming, uh, Zoom groups, that you can talk about that and uh, the three questions which we now have. So the three questions which I, I don't have in front of me here, <laughs> but uh, oh, they're just coming. Um, so, um, anyway, whilst I'm waiting to get... Oh, here they are. How do you cope with silence in your prayer? Is being still in prayer a challenge for you? What helps you to pray with simplicity? So we'll just have a little bit of quiet music in the background now as you consider those carefully. And if anybody wants to, on the chat room, put some comments about my input please do so but here it is how do you cope with silence in your prayer is being still in prayer a challenge for you what helps you pray with simplicity Just think deeply about those three little points there, three little questions.
Good, I'm getting some messages coming through there. People have been very appreciative of what's been happening and uh, are following carefully, so that's good. What did you think of Jim's prayer? What do you think of the prayer of John Vianney? How do you pray? Sometimes people think prayer's got to be very sophisticated. Not really. Remember how Jesus called over the children and said, be like the children. They do a better job than the adults. So that's very significant too. Dear friends, when I pray, I uh, try to, the first part of my prayer is just try and be still. How do you find it? Uh, takes a while, doesn't it? Sometimes I feel, oh, I'm getting this, almost a computer printout of things. Uh, so I think, oh, I must do this today. I always have a piece of paper beside me and a pen, and I write down the things that, you know, that come up that I need to do. And then I say, well, I will attend to that later, not now. So you don't have your silence, it's just basically working out what you're going to do today. It's time for listening, listening with the ear of the heart, trying to learn God's language. So Edna, you've uh, very much been impressed with Jim's prayer, that's good. So we could say at the beginning of your prayer, Edna, Jesus, here I am, it's Edna. And listen for the echo, come back. Edna, here I am, it's Jesus. So Karen, uh, for me, silencing the external is easy, but silencing the internal is more than a challenge. Join the club, I'm glad you said that. And uh, as I mentioned, um, these repetitive prayers, Karen, might be helpful to you, they're certainly helpful to me. Um, these uh, little repetitive words, Maranatha, as you breathe out, Maranatha, or the word Jesus, only Jesus, or Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner, repetitive prayer. Even parts of the Hail Mary. I mean, that's what the rosary is, everybody, isn't it? It's a repetitive prayer, and also you're using your fingers with the beads, so the um, distractions can be placed into the beads and out of you as well, so the touching of the rosary beads is also significant, apart from the words. Um, Trish, you're saying prayer for you is a conversation with God. Yes, of course. And uh, Melissa, the last line of Jim's story gave me goosebumps. Well, St. Go Saint Goosebumps, pray for us, yes. It's a beautiful story from, from uh, Cardinal Van Thuan. And you might want to... Uh, Look at the little booklet uh, that we'll make sure is on the website and look him up uh, on the Google. You'll find all sorts of wonderful prayers. Meeting him, he led me in a retreat when I was in Rome. Um, he, he was, the word is meek, M-E-E-K, -E -E such a meek man. I didn't realise till later on who he was and then when I was reading, I thought, my God, I was in the presence of a saint without even knowing it. But uh, he, he was so attentive and when I said I was from Australia, he immediately talked about his mum and his sisters over here. Uh, Melinda, I am blessed to live in the Blue Mountains. I've just had an experience of silence on a walk this morning as the track opened up to a beautiful vista. The silence hit me. It was loud. Well, Melinda, you've, that's fantastic. How we, we live in such a beautiful country of Australia and how we can uh, let nature still us. Sometimes I um, go for a little walk when I'm on visiting uh, in a country parish and uh, try to find a, a little lake. Again, going back to our Aboriginal people, they talk about the silence of the bush. Aboriginal people can really help us. Our first Australians can really help us to understand this stillness and this silence. Not being afraid of silence, a lot of people have this tyranny of silence, like a siren of noise, they've got to have noise. And then to be, it's almost like a drug, where you got to, once you get rid of that external noise, it takes a while just to get yourself um, distant from it. Um, Melinda, the silence opened up my heart and I began to cry. 
a rare gift of grace. That's the big word, Melinda, grace. Grace, initiative of God, all comes from God. And uh, to help me pray with simplicity is starting my prayer with Psalm 51. Asking every day for God's mercy. Yes, Psalm 51 is the big penitential psalm of the church. Uh, God, you are my God. Yeah, and uh, calling on God's mercy in the midst of our sinfulness. Uh, we pray that particularly on a Friday. Um, dear friends, I, I know you might sort of start saying, oh, this Archbishop is a bit odd, but uh, well, uh, can I just sort of conclude things by saying a little yeah, experience? Uh, over the years before I became a bishop when I was a parish priest, I, I used to love celebrating the morning masses and the baptisms. It was full on morning on the sun, Sunday morning. And then the people would go and then I'd close up the church. So I remember once, uh, more than once, closing the church and just loving to sit down in the church, a bit like you were saying there, Melinda, about sitting down and there was a, a loud silence. You mentioned the word loud there. It, it was a resonating silence of all that had happened, all the prayers that had gone on in that church that morning, as if, as if they were, the fragrance of those prayers were still there. And I, I would love spending quite a bit of time just on my own. I wanted the church to be locked. I didn't want anybody else in it. But in front of the Blessed Sacrament, just sitting there in a prayed up place, a place, a church where the Blessed Sacrament is, where the heartaches, the joys and sorrows of, of a morning uh, 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 congregations of people coming to praise God and to thank him still resonated like a beautiful perfume. So everybody, perhaps this deep inner journey that we're going on is not as complicated as you and I think. I mean, when you read these books on prayer and meditation, they do seem very complicated and they use all sorts of words. But as I said last time, don't get caught up in techniques. Jesus is not the result of a technique. It's an interpersonal relationship and it's as simple as John Vianney said and it's as simple as the gym prayer of Cardinal Thunth One. Here I am. I come to do your will, as the psalmist said. Um, psalm 63, Trish is saying, one of my favourite along with the psalm. Thanks, Bishop Chris. Oh, we, well, there you are. That's, we're both saying the same thing. Anne-Marie Caruana, I'm stunned by the thought of the Cardinal's nine years in solitary confinement. What strength and at the same time the surrender to God's help came to mind. Yes, yes. Um, quite incredible, really, his story. He used to write uh, a little saying every day and then would give it to somebody secretly and then they'd keep all these little pieces of paper and uh, they're now all published into Words of Hope. So I think we'll finish up now uh, just to basically say to you that uh, um, the uh, books that I've just mentioned will be on the website soon. Eventually there will be a transcript of my talk and, uh, and of course, uh, this is uh, on the archive, Heart to Heart archive on the catholicvoice.org.au website. And if you've missed one, you can play it back later on. Or if you want to go back to this one, it's available to you from this afternoon on. I know there's people from all over the place. Uh, we're getting a very good response to these uh, seminars. But I hope that it is something that you can... Uh, just use as a springboard and that you are beginning or beginning afresh or deepening uh, the Lord's hold of you uh, by daily prayer. And for those that are going to now group together in Zoom time, well and good, I hope it goes well and I hope that you can not just share about prayer but share prayer. So I'd like to conclude with um, uh, yet another beautiful psalm. I think always the psalms are lovely to begin with and, uh, and to end our time together. This is a simple little prayer from for, uh, Psalm 46 at the end of it. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold, our fortress. Be still 
and know that I am God. So just say your Christian name now for a moment. Say your Christian name. Yes. And I'll end up the sentence by saying, after your Christian name, here I am, it's Jesus. Only Jesus. Always Jesus. Forever Jesus. See you next time. God bless.